This paper uh, focuses specifically on whether or not in natural language discourses that spatial information can be considered a structural feature of that discourse. So if you tell me a story about something that you did this morning, you say I woke up in my bed and then I brushed my teeth in the bathroom, if you delete the information in the bed and in the bathroom, we're still able to figure out the bent structure of what you just said, and we're still able to figure out the temporal structure of what you just said. But the spatial information is this largely optional feature. Now, theoretical semanticists and pragmatic and pragmatists in linguistics have often talked about the spatial information and how it's an important part of discourse because certainly in experiential discourses, those events and those times, they're happening in a particular location. But for some reason, uh, that information is an optional feature on the linguistic surface. So it has interfered with the ability to really take a closer look and analysis of whether or not spatial information is a quote-unquote structural feature of discourse. So because spatial information is this optional feature on the linguistic surface, it can be difficult to find good data to do a very thorough analysis. And the type of data that I've found, which are narratives from serial offenders, um, for whatever reason, they include lots of spatial information when they're narrating their crimes about where they're going and who they're trying to find and all the terrible things that they do. Um, but this allows us to analyze more closely um, if the spatial information is correlating in any way with other types of structural information in the discourse. So the two major findings, I think, in this paper are that the particular type of spatial information that shows the largest amount of correlation between structural information and discourse is this notion of granularity. So granularity is scale size, the scale of what is being described. So scales can be very small. I can say the coffee is in my cup, which is very small. I can say the coffee is in Belfast, Maine. Belfast, Maine is very large. So that difference in granularity scale varies relative to the position of the events and the time being described in, di in the discourses. Um, and it appears to be very regular across many different types of authors, at least for this corpus of serial offenders. So different types of authors, whatever the narration that they're giving, the granularity structure is largely similar, which is it starts very large at the beginning of discourses, it gets very small, and often it goes off large again. These, the transitions between these granularities um, often correspond with larger chunks of events. So the larger granularities particularly associate with pre-crime type of events, and smaller granularities deal with crime type of events. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, and then if there are any type of post-crime events, those are typically large granularities as well. So because events and the temporal sequence are considered to be structural features of narrative discourse, it's exciting to see spatial information varying relative to that as well. Before my career as a, as a linguist, I was an attorney, uh, and I did a lot of violent crime research, and I had access to lots of this type of data. But once I started uh, working in linguistics, I'm just personally interested in semantics and pragmatics of discourse, and one thing that emerges very clearly is this notion that, okay, space, spatial information is a sort of optional feature on the linguistic surface. It hasn't really, in my opinion, gotten you know, a very close formal analysis because of this impediment in the data. Um, but then here I have these, these narratives that seem to be in contrast to that notion. If there's so much space going on in these types of discourses, um, the possibility of that not bearing any sort of relationship to the other elements of structure uh, would seem very odd to me. It could have been the case of what we would have found, that there was no relationship whatsoever between the types of spatial information and other structural elements like time and event, but we indeed, indeed did find that there are correlations. And one of the interesting things about those correlations is that it's on the larger document level, it's on the text level structure. So linguists look at structure in terms of the local structure, which is the relationships between the clauses, but also the, the text structure, what's happening on a larger scale. So it'll be interesting to see moving forward what the further relationship is between spatial information that's communicated on the local level, at the clause level, and how that contributes to these larger textual patterns that we're seeing. Uh, methodologically, I'm, I'm steeped in uh, computational linguistic approaches and in discourse processing and natural language processing. Um, it, there are many difficult challenges, so uh, systems look at text summarization, the resolution of pronouns, and these are perpetually difficult tasks. So if we can use this information in some way to boost the performance of those systems, uh, that seems to be a very feasible uh, route to go and, and one that I'm very interested in exploring. In particular, 
this research tends to indicate that knowing where you are in a particular discourse constrains in some way or informs in some way the type of information that you would expect to see. So in terms of prediction or even qualitative spatial reasoning and discourse, training a computer to do this, um, you can often get boosts in performance by just giving it more information.